Another part of it is that a rich heritage is a terrible thing to waste, to leave behind, because it provides confidence to people in going forward. They can turn back to their heritage. I, I recall one of my favorite illustrations of this being um, when a young American boy who had done graffiti in Singapore around 1993, 90, yeah, was according to Singapore law, sentenced and flogged. And the Western media rose in a um, uh, uh, snide condemnation of civil authorities in Singapore, describing them as barbaric, still whipping young people in this age. And the people of Singapore took umbrage to that Western condescension. And I recall that I was in France when um, the, uh, on the program at Fontainebleau at INSEAD when um, a minister from Singapore was addressing the EU in Brussels. And he said to them, you hairy barbarians, who are you to tell us about civilization? When our forefathers were wearing silk, yours were still running around with leaves around their loins. How dare you, because you got technology advantage, speak to us like that. Well, I want to say to you that the advantage is shifting to us. It was a very bold and dramatic uh, public statement. Uh, in fact, many people jokingly attribute to that statement the 1997 Asian financial crisis, that that was the worst revenge on um, the haughty Asians. But that aside, it is so important for us to engage our history. And in my view, one of the best ways to teach history is to borrow from the great sociologist, C. Wright Mills, who says that history is best understood at the intersection of its grand march, the great statistics of 10,000 people who died in this war, and the personal troubles of individual, of that one soldier who had this kind of experience. And so I thought that one of the best ways for us to engage this history is to meet the men who made the history, the women who made the history, and to get them to speak to some aspects of that history from their experience, and that this can enrich the understanding of a generation. We've taken so many different subjects since we started this series. We've talked to opposition politics in Nigeria, returning to NEPU, and an old NEPU strongman uh, as a guest. We've talked to uh, traditional rulership, and we've had the leading traditional rulers in the country as our guests. We've talked to the history of Nigerian policy, foreign policy, and we had many of the great players in that arena as guests on this uh, um, series, and so on and so forth. Today, it's time to speak to the important subject of a military in politics. And we are very, very favored with outstanding and extraordinary personages who have participated as men of leadership in the military. And we have the privilege today to listen to them uh, as we ask a few questions and get them to give us uh, a sense. As our flyers indicate, we have with us um, a number of former chiefs of defense staff, including General Martin, Martin Luther Aguay, um, uh, General Alexander Ogumudia, um, we are still to find uh, General Lania Kiriade. Uh, we also have um, with us um, men like General Umahi, General Ubi Umahi, whose uh, uh, photograph just appeared in front of me. Uh, 
Admiral Itunu Hotunu uh, and uh, Admiral Murtala Nyako. I know he was struggling with the technology a few minutes ago. Uh, I hope that it goes very well. A couple of, uh, 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 of, of us here who belong to a different generation uh, are not so conversant with these new technologies, but uh, eventually they, they can uh, get it on and they will join us when they do uh, manage to get it on. So thank you so very much uh, uh, for uh, this privilege. Now, I would like to begin with uh, General Martin Luther uh, Aguay and to ask him to please help us uh, in uh, um, getting a sense for a subject that has been in the news quite a bit this week or this last week. Um, a channel's correspondent was in um, Amina and I get as part of it, 60th anniversary celebrations for Nigeria, we interviewed both our President Ibrahim Babangida and former head of state, uh, Abdul Salam Abubakar. And this question of the military in politics and its impact on Nigeria came up in those interviews. Uh, both men gave interesting and different uh, uh, answers to uh, the question. Uh, whereas um, General Abdul Salam, for example, spoke, um, I think, quite um, uh, uh, extensively about how the military's involvement in politics damaged things like discipline within the army, it was not good for the army. Um, General Babangida spoke to the military as a developmental force, and that it was not so bad for the country because the military was a force for development. And these raise many questions. Um, of course, people had their different takes on these perspectives. And I would like you, uh, General Gwai, to please give us a sense for your perception of the role of the military uh, uh, in politics and how you read it for good or for ill regarding the military as an institution and Nigerian society uh, in general. Uh, <clears throat> th thank you, General, welcome. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and thank you very much for the opportunity. But uh, I also thank you, I have seen a lot of faces that I know, though we have not, uh, link up for a while so thank you for the invitation to be uh, to this uh, platform that i will be able to connect with some of my seniors my colleagues and my those who are junior to me but um let let me start by saying that it is very difficult for me to talk so much about politics and military because I, in as much as I agree that the, all human beings are political animals, uh, there are those animals that have actually gone playing really into politics. And there are those who have really been at the periphery of politics. And though there are those who, yes, by geopolitical uh, uh, happenings and by their pro professional calling, they, do, they cannot shy away from politics. Um, so I want to say that when I heard you calling some other names, I was so glad that they could be able to put the whole thing in its perspective because some of them were actors and they were in the military when uh, even the first military coup took place. Uh, I was then a schoolboy in secondary school, so I will talk more of uh, my understanding as uh, somebody outside, and I will not be able to talk much about the real political game and everything, because even though I joined during military rule, uh, I, have, I never really held any political appointment. And I thought even throughout my career, whether it was going to be military or civil rule, I would have played the same role I played up to when I retired. 
So that I would say, yes, um, uh, we can't run away from it, but I think we have to look at the military rule if it is to correct things and we have seen in other places, then it should be for a short time. But when it becomes protracted and it starts becoming uh, long, then you start finding that the military that got into politics, politics started getting into the military. And by politics getting into the military, it began to create some challenges. Uh, I, as I was going through this thing, I just found out that between 1960 and 2004, there were 105 uh, overthrow of government in Africa. And out of those, are we all going to say they happen because of national interest and protection of national interest or it started maybe in protection of national interest and along the line, it changed into something else. Because we, uh, as we dis uh, discussed last time and I listened to those wonderful uh, experts and uh, practitioners in our foreign policy, foreign policy is the way nations interact with others. While the defense policy is how nations intend to deal with international security and how it can see it can use its armed forces to achieve its national goals and interests so when the military that's supposed to be used is now becoming the people dictating everything then you begin to have a challenge and and sometimes at the earlier stages as I've said, between 1960 and 2004, we have had 105 interventions. It means at one time it was fashionable. And it means there were those who acted in national interest and there were those who were used to attain other people's national interests. Because we have to remember that nations act in their national interest and other nations may whip sentiments and encourage certain actions by us in this country in the interest of their own national interest and protection of their national uh, survival and, uh, and interest. So I think in that sense, we will. And then looking at military rule, yes, a lot has happened in Nigeria as one was growing up to see so many quick decisions made, but the danger is that the military people are trained for quick action and move on. And unfortunately in that, our decision-making will not be in-depth. And we can attribute a lot of, with hindsight, I think there are a lot of decisions the military took while in government that has brought a lot of challenges to Nigeria as a nation state today. And there are so many things that the military uh, decisions that were taken were so good in development because the military decision is a sharp one, quick one and on. But when it comes to politics, I think some of the decisions because of the inherent nature of the military itself, it may not be deliberate it may not be really that is the but the consequences were not thought of at that time and shift the country into some of the areas that we now find ourselves that towards the end the military started taking even in military affairs they started considering so many political uh, issues before military decisions were taken so that is what I will say that um, the, the sum of the action of the military were really good, but for that time, and some of them in strategic, were not strategic looking. And strategically today, if you look back 10, 20 years, you will see some of the faulty decisions 
that uh, the military took that is following us today uh, and people are talking, for example, the constitution. I've had so many people talk so much about the constitution of this country that people are insisting that we need to revisit it holistically. And, and I think at the time the military took the decision to get us a constitution so that they can hand over Things may not have been done in a long, with a long term view. And now we get ourselves saddled with some of these things. But having said so, I want to also say that the military, by its nature, has also helped solve a lot of problems and place Nigeria in a very, uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a very respectable form. Some of the military decisions in, uh, in, in our West African sub-region, the formation of a thing like ECOMOC, the, which by extension and by uh, chapter eight of the UN Constitu uh, constitution, this is where we're heading to today, partnership, regional partnership in doing things in finding security and in advancing security in regions uh with the un and other uh, key players but i think we over concentrate on external picture and forgot the internal picture and that is why today i think because we were taught and concentrated on enemy and we always thought that enemy is external our training and our action was to deal with an external enemy and when the enemy now becomes internal, as it happened in most African countries today, it's internal challenges that countries are having, not external. Uh, I saw a report in 2000, uh, there were 30 conflicts in, uh, in Africa, and only three of them were uh, uh, interstate. All the rest were intrastate. So, the challenges are intrastate, but we are looking at the intrastate as enemy and attacking it and trying to resolve it as dealing with enemy. And then we find the whole thing is a losing up because in enemy, you want to capture territory, but in what is happening, which the military circle called the fourth generation warfare is an internal thing where you need to win heart and mind and that is what I think is missing. General, that is a very important subject around soft power, which I will return to, uh, uh, because very often when we think of these conflicts, we are not focusing on soft power. That's the challenge we're dealing with in the Northeast and many other places. But staying with the subject of strategy and staying with you for a bit. Uh, the military, military science has been the major source of gifting to management I, I don't know what has happened. I am very sorry. Some 
technical failure. I apologize. I am in the meanwhile going to be coming off some other device while we look at what has gone wrong. Uh, I was saying, uh, General, just uh, before that happened, that um, military science has been a great source of gifting to management science and other sciences in areas of leadership, in areas of strategy. And uh, you talked about strategy. Now, what we have found is that in our situation, we have been gifted with a lot of talents in the military. I mean, there used to be the old joke in the 60s that, oh, those who were not capable went to the army. But we know that some of our best trained people today in this country are in the military. Uh, so when we then look at strategy and how the military has fed in deploying strategy to solve some of our big challenges, there is a tendency to ask, where did things go wrong? When we talk strategy, for example, as a teacher of strategy myself, I generally talk about four levels of strategy. One level we call corporate strategy, which defines what business are we in. Uh, second level is basic strategy, how we gain advantage over rivals. A third level is um, functional strategy, how the various functions align to the basic strategy and goal that uh, drives performance. And a fourth level, we like to talk about institutional strategy which is really about culture, uh, how the culture affects effectiveness in achieving goals. Where do you think we have had a challenge with strategy as a military in Nigeria, which at least in the area of governance uh, has left us significantly challenged? Uh, we did very well in some very foreign assignments, and that's the point I was going to come to later, in fact, uh, I, I tell the story often of giving a lecture at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington like 20 years or more ago. And there were um, um, senior officers from the Pentagon who were in that lecture. And afterwards, one of them said to me, you know, you have some outstanding officers. There was a young um, Lieutenant Colonel from Nigeria, Lola who was such a remarkable commander in Somalia, you know. Um, but when we look at how the military has engaged some of Nigeria's problems, you sometimes wonder what were the strategic challenges? Was it culture? Was it what went wrong in terms of how the army deployed its knowledge of strategy in solving problems as a military in politics? Uh well, uh, uh, let, uh, I would say it's actually the issue of culture and the issue of how we, uh, we uh, apply it to uh, the strategy to what we do. The number one issue, let's be very honest, and I hope some of my colleagues and my seniors that are around will also chip in and confirm whether what my speculation is right or wrong, is that in, what, in this so-called military Sorry, my language, but I, I, that's what I feel. In the so-called military government that we have run in Nigeria, how many of them were really involving the whole military? It involved maybe a few who became ministers and governors, then the head of state, and those were the people. So in a, in a, in a group of over 100,000 and a group of over 20,000 uh, officers, and uh, maybe out of that 20,000, you have about 10% or 5% of them that are really vast in strategic leadership and training. And they are not being utilized because they have concentrated in doing their military profession. Then how could you then blame the whole military and look at the military that is the military that you don't have the foresight to look at uh, 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 things holistically and strategically. The unfortunate aspect is that uh, a lot of knowledgeable officers continue to do their, play their role in the military 
whether it was a military government or a civilian government. Unfortunately, because these fine, knowledgeable officers happened to be military officers, and because the government was happened to be a military government, they are all been blanketed and put into the same basket and said, oh, the military, the military, the military. So I, I, I think that is where we got it wrong. We got it wrong because some came in the name of the military, but yes. unfortunately they not carry the whole military. And at, at the end, the military is being judged today for decisions that were taken by mostly a military civilian group because most of the ministers at federal level and commissioners at state level were civilians. Most of key office holders were civilians. Unfortunately, because the head of government were military, everything is looked upon in the military domain. I make bold to say that if you check and look at what the military itself have done internally, you will find that there are really strategic decisions that have been taken correctly by the military and have been upheld by the military. But unfortunately, because the military that is doing that is not part of the military that was in government, you couldn't see the strategic outlook and the strategic dealing and the strategic uh, uh, planning by the military. Rather, what you saw was the tactical move by uh, those in government, because they were acting like the civilians and politicians, they look at the tactical gain they would gain in the next two, three weeks or three months or one year, not looking at the bold decision that what we are doing, what would be the consequences of this action in 20 years from today. That is strategic thinking and that is strategic dealing. We personalize issue at, the, at that level and we, we, we went to play, as I think Chino Achebe said, our league with second 11 and we left the first level on the bench. So that is what I think has happened. But my other senior colleagues and colleagues are, are around, they will testify whether I'm right in my judgment or wrong, but that is my personal judgment of what has taken place. And because we have been taught we are dealing with an enemy, anything we look at then was looking at the basis of an enemy. And that becomes a very big problem. What is the security architecture we have left? What is the way our, our, our engaging people into the service is? How is the progression plan? And how is the career of progression of uh, men and officers laid down? All these things will have a long-term effect on what you are doing. And some of what we are seeing today, we are reaping from the, those inaction and wrong decisions that we took 15, 20 years ago is coming to hunt us today. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much. Uh, there is no question that, that a lot of those actions are coming to haunt all of us as a country. Uh, I mean, and I'll turn to, um, I'm still trying to find out if General uh, Ogumudia has come on, because uh, I would have wanted to turn to him. But if General Ogumudia has not come on, I'll turn to General uh, Umahi, who's a political scientist by training, one of the very best that came out of UI, uh, UI's political department. Uh, department of political I think General Ogumudia is in, is on. Is in, ah, OK. Yeah. General. Please, uh, I'd like you to come in uh, on that uh, question of why we made choices that are haunting us today when the army had and still has quality leaders by training. <laughs> Former Chief of Defense Staff, General Alexander Ogumudia. He has to unmute himself. Okay, unmute yourself. Okay, unmute yourself. Okay, 
Try he's still it. mute. He's still mute. Could somebody tell him he's still mute. Uh, uh, okay, okay, let's let's, let's, let's get begin to respond while we deal with that issue. Thank you very much, um, my dear prof. Um, I, I want to say that um, at the beginning, oh, let, let, let me first of all just uh, say a few things. Uh, number one is that um, I am in the midst of uh, military giants, those who, uh, who taught me those who groomed me. So it is a privilege to play on this platform with uh, this, my uh, superior uh, colleagues. Uh, how, how, for you to be able to know exactly what my age in the military uh, uh, was. Uh, when I was um, a cadet, because I was the best all-round cadet and first in order of merit and award winner, sort award winner. Yeah. I had the privilege yeah. of sitting next to- What name to are you under? We need to open you. What name are you under? I had the, can, I, can I go on? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, go on, please. I was talking to General Gumudia. Okay. I had the privilege of sitting next to um, General Babangida, who was uh, the chief of uh, army staff. And when Abacha coup took place in 1993, I was just a senior captain. So you can understand uh, when you parade me with uh, these uh, people like uh, why General Gomudia, that I'm just but uh, a small boy. But that notwithstanding, I have uh, also a contribution to make, but it's a privilege to, to, to be on this platform with uh, such a milit senior military officers. I want to say that. Let me start by quoting um, Major Chukuma Nzogu. He said, it is only in the Nigerian army that you find Nigerians. What was he talking about? He meant that it was only in the Nigerian army that you will find out those who were roundly and truly Nigerians. So before the advent of the military into Nigerian politics, the military used to be a signature of true Nigerians. But the moment the military got into uh, politics, other things were miscarried. The military got involved in the area that they were not properly trained to operate in, to play in. And I want to say, talking about the contribution of the military, the strategic con contributions of the military, I want to say that the military derailed itself as a result of societal pressures. I am talking of ethnic pressures. I am talking of from the religious fundamental pressures. Those were the things that derailed the military. The military meant well at the beginning, but when the, all this interplay began to take roots in the decision-making process, of course, because they were not supposed to be, uh, to be there, to be some of the factors, they completely derailed the military decision-making process. And rather than doing things on their merits, things were done to satisfy the, those who were on the sideline but dictating the decision-making process in the military. For instance, if you listened to, or you heard what was said about the reason 
why Abiola's election was as the president of Federal Republic of Nigeria was not announced. It is, it is, it, it, it's so touching and it's so pathetic that such a thing could have happened and the reasons given could have been given by a military head of state. And there is no doubt that those reasons given may have played out in the decision not to announce the, uh, Abiola as the person who won the election, the presidential election in Nigeria. So what am I saying? What I'm saying in essence is that there were some factors that ought not to have infiltrated into decision-making process in the military that accounted for many mistakes that the military made through her sojourn in politics. And that has disastrous consequences for this nation and we are still reaping there from. It has disastrous consequences for, pro <coughs> excuse me, for professionalism, even within the military. And it is still showing, even in the performance of the military till today. And it's unfortunately, those kind of actors are still playing from the background destroying what should have been a developmental progress for this nation. So I want to say in summary that the military came in to do well, but so many factors, especially ethnic, religious, greed, and some other issues, personal interests, they infiltrated the decision-making process. Yeah, how all of those, yes, thank you, General. How those affected professionalism is very, very important. Because in some ways, the strength of the nature of a professional military can help in governance. For example, the way General Park took South Korea forward by ap applying military discipline in the way problems were tackled and economic development was planned and delivered. But we find that the Nigerian military in politics consistently made very terrible decisions, let's be very frank, that have damaged the economic prospects of Nigeria. Uh, 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 because it would seem that the fundamental thing that makes the military such a disciplined organization were constantly evaded. Um, I don't know, General Gomudia, we can now get on. Maybe he can give us a big sweeping brush on what really prevented the military from being as effective as it could have been a South Korea type military in the Nigerian context. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, thanks, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, I want to thank you, Prof, for this invitation to be part of this occasion, but uh, I've, I've had quite uh, a couple of things there which uh, seem to resonate with me. But you see, I think if we, I, I want to avoid the blame game and going backwards. But one needs to reflect on certain things in order to be able to go forward. Uh, first and foremost, the military, uh, the impact of the military on governance and, uh, and it's the impact of our involvement in politics on the military itself, I think is almost clear, but yes. just to me, it is a two-way thing. Uh, part of it is uh, positive, 
that, that is not to say I'm supporting the military going to government. Let, let me quickly clear myself. But the positive aspect is that in most countries in the world, I'm sure you will be aware that a lot of uh, uh, inventions, engineering fields, and uh, technical policies and all that have come to being by virtue of the military and the requirement for their use in combat. So as a matter of fact, the military has engineered a number of things. Now, if in our own case, uh, at a, and then in our own case rather, at a point, uh, people felt that the military was a place where for those who couldn't go to school or couldn't read, that was the general perception when I, at a, when I wanted to join the, the secondary school, the military secondary school, that was the impression people gave. And uh, I kept laughing until we got to the school site and I saw that uh, it was a level playing field too for everybody. Now, I think that, that the, the, uh, the uh, impact of the military on governance had made it possible for the military to open up a little bit unlike what it was before. Nobody knew anything about the military. But by being uh, inclusive in what was going on, it meant that people were able to see more about the values of the military. So to that extent, uh, we can use some of the, the potentials of the military for national development, for instance, research and development, uh, where, where we can bring in uh, the knowledge of some of those areas. We want to repair armored vehicles. We want to uh, fix uh, some technical issues. Uh, it is possible for the military to work hand in hand with civilian experts so as to build a defense industrial complex. So to that extent, there is something positive there. But having said that, when you come up in a military government, you know it's not a consensus government. One man wakes up in the night and takes everybody by storm. So uh, that cannot be accepted in a democratic setting. And right now, I think we, we thank God we are doing well democratically because for 20 years now, uh, we've done elections and uh, no matter how controversial they are, like somebody said, we are still going on. And I think uh, that's the way it should be. The system should correct itself. It must make effort to correct itself. There's nobody who is perfect. Nobody knows it all. But if you do, if you are if you are if you fail to correct yourself, then of course you're going to lead to a disaster. That is the way I see our role that uh, we have played within uh, governance and uh, the impact itself. Now within the military, each time there was a military coup, it was terrible. The, Suddenly, one of your juniors became a boss. You couldn't see him. You and it, it, it brought a lot of this this affection within uh, the military, and it was not the best. So, to me, uh, there were even people who were looking forward to military appointments rather than professional appointments. So, uh, when you have that kind of situation, naturally, it's bound to affect professionalism, and I think that is the real negative of the whole thing. Now, for governance. Where did we get it wrong with all these potentials that we have in the military? You see, anything we want to do, whether it is the military or uh, as part of governance, the most critical thing is national interest. National interest. Now, what the few people will say, oh, they don't quite know what these interests are. And we say, look, no, the core interests of Nigeria essentially security and welfare of his people. Now, other things cannot be defined under it. And you will then have things like economic growth, uh, territorial integrity, defense of the, the okay, sovereignty of the people, defense of its territorial integrity, peace, democracy, economic growth, and social justice. All these all go into that national interest. Now, if a leader takes over and you look at this interest. These are the things really that, that, that are guiding government. Even all the ministries that are set up, they are meant to, they are meant to, 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 uh, to act on these issues. 
it, it could be health, it could be uh, uh, foreign affairs, it could be internal affairs, it could be agriculture. All these things are captured within that national interest. So you want to make a budget, it must look at that national interest in order to know really what, how that budget should be allocated in such a way that we do not have uh, uh, the wrong priorities going to the wrong place, uh, whereas the things should go to somewhere else. Somewhere else. At the same time, uh, foreign policy ought to give us the branding that we need outside there. So you need to strengthen it because, in fact, the foreign uh, uh, foreign affairs ministry that we had in those days. It was feared in the whole of Africa because we had some great men who did a wonderful job. Uh, so many of them, so many of them. Even till now, there are great people in there. But you need more resources there in order to be able to make the point. And when you can capture the minds and, and the culture, and you can show our culture out there, our potentials out there, then you are likely to be able to, to get respected. America's foreign policy is one of the things that's making them so vibrant everywhere in the world. But now they are saying America first. Okay, so they have cut their legs one leg up when you say America first. But generally, that plays a key role. Then of course your internal, internal policies too are very important because they must be in consonance with the best rules, the best uh, global best practices, you know, so that you don't offend people out there because if you are doing something internally and people outside there are not happy about it, of course, they can bring in sanction, sanctions against you. They can bring in all sorts of things, take you up at the UN, and in the end, you find your country will be having problems. I remember one time when there were sanctions against Nigeria. You drive through Marina. As long as that key side is, you find only one ship. That was the effect of sanctions. So how would you import? And when, meanwhile, uh, if trade, international trade is essentially by, by ship because the kind of cargo that is carried by ship, no other means can carry them. And yet you've offended the whole world and the sanctions. So our, both our internal policies and foreign policies must play into this in order to make sure that we do what is sustainable within the global uh, uh, sphere. Now, uh, so for, to me, getting it right or wrong is a function of where any leader will depart from this interest. If a leader decides to leave this interest, which is that of security and welfare of, of his people, then of course, anything can happen. And, do it, and when you depart, but we should also understand that once these leaders come up, which is again one of the problems that we had in the military, Every leader that came, there were people who had his ears. So pressures from those people will come. Somebody wants Sharia. Another man wants one thing. Another man wants another thing. And so in the end, if a leader is not really resolute, he can be carried in all directions. And in the end, it could be like moving around, with, just moving without achieving any result. So those kind of things are played seriously into our, our system. Uh, Again, in looking at national interests, you must carry everybody along. If you don't, of course, the consequences will be there. I think these are the kind of things that I see as having happened in a number of places. In a number of places, but uh, if you know the role Nigeria played, even in the military regime, in bringing that monster of uh, racism in South Africa. Yes. To, to, to an end, I think they need, those leaders need to be commended. Uh, uh, so I, I, on, my, on, on this note, I think I, I, I want to thank you for- uh, the Thank, thank you so much, General. I, I, I'm going to return in the course of this conversation to the military, military power, foreign policy, because of ECOMOG and the many things that happened. I think it's a very important point uh, for us to engage around but still staying with effectiveness in national service as a governing body. You go to Egypt and you see 
the impact of the military in Egypt in terms of development activity. Um, the construction work done by the military in Egypt, the, I mean, it's almost a government within a government, the military establishment. Um, what were the factors that led to the divorce of the military establishment from the small group in the military that grabbed power in Nigeria as compared, for example, to Egypt? Because uh, uh, in many of these places, the military was in power, the military was in power, and the military was used for developmental purposes. In Nigeria, it seemed like a small clique grabbed the army. Once they were the group that carried out a coup, uh, they basically treated the army as a, an inferior cousin. And then somehow a major can stay in a room and look at his, uh, and say that general will not see your guard today. And that, those kinds of things were happening. I, I guess that in the many, many reasons that led General Basanjo when he returned to power to purge from the ranks of the military, all officers who had been exposed to political office. In your view, uh, was that the move to make and how did this whole business of the relationship between uh, officers who were involved in public office and those who were not affect the culture and the atmosphere, the sense of uh, 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 a spirit of core that military is really uh, famous for. And how can the military regain a cult culture of a professional force after those kinds of experiences? OK, Th that's for me? Yes, for you, General, yes. OK, all right. Uh, you see, first and foremost, we must also understand that uh, in a military regime, the leader appoints his governors. Now, having appointed the governor, those governors saw themselves as above their colleagues in the military. So where is the meeting point? The, the, some of those, the only area where you see people perhaps meeting with their colleagues is where they are cosmates. You might walk in and he knows you are his cosmate. He's there because he's luckier than you, not because he's better than you. And then you can relate. But ordinarily, uh, the moment they became governors, it is uh, it's something that, in fact, there's a very funny example that happened somewhere in Lagos here. I won't give names. There was a time a coup took place, and somebody was appointed a governor. Now, he lived in an apartment of six flats, you know, somewhere in Ikoi here. And so the central corridor is where they will use and climb and all that. And the children, uh, used to cross from one of the apartments to the other apartment because they were friends. Now, the moment the guy was made governor, the SSS came and put a table there and mounted guard there. The children were not allowed to cross to the other <laughs> side. So, <laughs> so when the father came back, the, the boys were telling the SSS man that, look, our friends are inside there. We want to go and see them. They say, no, you can't go there. <laughs> so when when the father came back, they asked the father that. They told the father that, look, uh, their friend has been arrested that they're inside the room there. <laughs> so the father said, no, if anything, it is they who have been arrested because they can't go there. You know, anyway, that's on the lighter side. But that kind of thing does not bring bring in the kind of cohesion you expect. But again, don't forget, they have a political mandate once they have been appointed by a president. Now, the mandate of the military is a purely military one. So where really are they supposed to meet? In the case of Egypt, they have engineered it right from the top in such a way that the military can play into civil. So if you have all the equipment for engineering to be able to make roads, it is possible that they can award road contract to a, an engineer regiment. That is possible. In even, I remember when we had just that uh, national, uh, the Nigerian external telecom building on Marina that got yes. burnt. Yes. That was the only place where you could call out of Nigeria in those days. And that was the level of technology at that time. Now, uh, with that sort of thing, 
our officers and soldiers from the core signals came to operate the equipment when there was a strike and the workers refused to work because the number of telecoms equipment that were in there were known to us in signals. Uh, so you can see that there are areas where cooperation can be gotten, but you are looking at the strategic level now where policies are going to be made. Uh, I was at the work college. How do I play into uh, what a governor say in uh, uh, those states is doing? Nothing. Except we we'll go on our normal visit, we can write uh, position papers on how government is doing and all that because we work college visits. And, so we contribute our own to the development there. But if there's a direct policy to for, uh, from the top for the military to be involved in something, then of course it will be involved. But as, as, a, as a general, I tell you quite frankly, I have always had my reserves about those who say they should create farms for the military to feed the country. The reason is simple. In the heat of battle, what do you want? You want a farmer or a soldier? I want a soldier in the heat of battle. So my soldier, if you tie him down farming yams, the day I need him, he'll be thinking of yams. And that is not what I joined the army for. There, there are extension workers who can, uh, who can do all those kinds of, there are thousands who have no jobs. They can be employed. You know, the nation can be mobilized for employment, I tell you. It, there is no country that cannot generate, generate employment. So many areas where, that you can look at and generate employment. So uh, if we go that way, then of course, uh, uh, and then we try and work out some cohesion in areas where the military has some potential that is perhaps more than what the civil have. In, in, okay, look at, for instance, in, uh, in some of those countries where probably they will uh, involve the military in engineering works. It, they will bid, those people will bid just like any other contractor. So it means that they must have the correct equipment, not just the equipment for maintaining barrack. If you have that, you know, how will you play? You can't play in that kind of game. But if you have equipment that's able to match what, what Julius Berger has, the principles are the same. They all studied uh, civil engineering. They, they, all of them, there are quantities of it there, there are uh, mechanical engineers there, because there are mechanical parts of some of those bridges and all that. So you, you, you have, you, you, it's a holistic thing. It's a whole country that should be mobilized. It's not just uh, the, the military, but the military can always give a leeway. Look at, we had barely bridges for crossing uh, uh, obstacles, uh, uh, marine obstacles during the war. It's a special technology. Within uh, an hour, a bridge is put across a plane. It's, it's like uh, magic. Now, these are areas a village is cut off uh, suddenly because of flood. These people can be brought in. And so aid to civil authority also is one area where the military has played. And it has worked well because there is a policy guiding that. Somebody has made that request, and then approvals are given, the due process is done, equipment mobilized uh, based on funds that perhaps are requested for. So I think that is the kind of thing we should, uh, we should be looking at. But let me quickly no. point out something again. Last point, last point. All I right, have, I, when I was in service, when I was in service, I had an engineer brigade in uh, Ede, and they were given a job in uh, by uh, by the governor in Oshoko the contractors decided to to go on strike because uh, the army was giving the job since the quotation was left and they were sure they could do it because there are so many areas where they caught losses and all that and uh, the matter was so serious so they brought it to me so I said look come our first priority is not to go and uh, fight people over job. The governor has his own political responsibility. Tomorrow, they will be asking him, come, this army that you asked to do bridges, let them vote for you. 
So you demand me suddenly say that look, you you people are not uh, uh, you, that there's need for those contractors to be considered. And so if that happens, you have no business being worried about it. That's not your primary job. But if it comes, take it. And so that was what happened. Eventually, they gave it to them. And I said, well, well done. We'll go ahead. That's it. So thank you. Thank you very much, General. Uh, I, I want to, I, know, I don't know if Admiral Rutala Nyako has come in. Uh, uh, like I said, we were talking just before we, we went on, and he was struggling with getting his device ready. Uh, but you know, he's told a number of stories uh, uh, to me around the choice between serving a political position and staying in the military. Uh, he argues, for example, that he really never wanted a political position. He tells an interesting story of how uh, he was to either take delivery of a ship or something in the UK after training. And then he came home just for a short couple of uh, days, leave, didn't even bring a uniform with him. And then he gets a signal uh, that he was supposed to report and he didn't have a uniform he had to struggled to watch something and reported and he was, became governor of Niger State. It was way back in 1975 or thereabouts. And um, how he kept saying he wanted to leave a uh, uh, um, uh, political position to return to uh, military uh, responsibility. Now that we are not sure that he's here, uh, probably we'll turn to Admiral uh, Hotonu uh, to uh, reflect generally on these issues that uh, have been on the table and particularly perhaps to look at what options did officers have under a military rule? Could an officer say, um, sorry, I will not accept, or please, can you excuse me from uh, uh, um, a duty of being military governor? Uh, did, did anybody really have the disposition to do that? And if such a person was made to then go and military governor, and then a president comes, just like the way President Obasanjo did, and purges all those who have been governors, uh, do they have the right to say, look, I didn't want to be governor, I begged, I don't want to be governor, and then I was made governor? And what is your general take on this challenge of um, going between political life and professional military life. Uh, thank you very much for having me this afternoon. And I feel very honored to be in the presence of my very, very, very senior bosses, fathers, and um, a colleague. I also, I'm part of the um, set of people who were children, literally, when um, the country first had its first military incursion. And I will say that I and um, most of my ilk didn't know different. That's the life we knew. Um, that's what looked like the norm to us. So um, our perspective is kind of, at least my perspective, is kind of different from the perspective of a lot of, you know, my very senior bosses. Because like I said, we really didn't know any other kind of life. And having not known any other kind of life, um, you did what you were told to do. Because when we went to training school, um, you were taught that you couldn't refuse a lawful order. And if what was happening at the time was that this was what we were doing, which we were made to understand it was part of aid to military, uh, to civil power, excuse me. 
um, if that was part of what you needed to do as part of aging civil power, then you did it. So um, I don't know if that means that our perspective was skewed. I don't want to say that. And I don't want to say that for the simple reason that nations have different trajectories to achieving true statehood, true nationhood. It's interesting, for instance, to note that the United Kingdom, as we know it today, came into being just in 1707. And that's a mere 68 years before the American War of Independence. Now, to the casual observer, it would look like this is a country that has existed for centuries, but that's not so. It would also be very interesting to note that um, Northern Ireland didn't come into the Union until the early part of last century. So what am I saying with all this? What I'm saying with all this is that the trajectory of each nation to statehood is different. It so happens that for us in Africa, a lot of our countries became independent late 50s, early 60s. And that was a time of great movement in the world where you had, you know, the bipolar um, world. And the great powers, as it were, were fighting for the soul of Africa. So the truth of the matter is that we really didn't have a choice but to grow very fast. And what growing very fast probably meant for a lot of our countries was that there was a lot of instability, there was a lot of insurrection. And I say this again from the perspective of someone who was very young when all this was happening. And that's all that we knew. And all that we saw was that these were our countries. They were trying to grow. Things were happening which we couldn't understand. And um, suddenly, it was all over. And we were brought into democracy. So I see it as part of nation building, growth and um, the kind of change that will ultimately uh, bring us to the point where, as uh, my very senior boss, uh, General Mudia said earlier, um, a point where the military is spearheading inventions. Uh, even the internet that we're talking on now is a military invention. And recently, I mean, as recently as two days ago, we know that um, President Trump is in a naval hospital. And there's a reason for him to be there. After all, he's the leader of the free world, the leader of uh, the democratic world. But guess what? He's in a military hospital because that's where he would get the best care. So somehow, um, I think we're finding our way to getting a situation where there is proper balance. And um, like I said earlier, I think it's all part of um, statehood. And that's all I have to say for you. Sorry, we'll come back to you. Thank you very much, Admiral. Um, but let me return again uh, to General Martin Luther Aguay. Uh, uh, with a question uh, which uh, you actually did um, uh, 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 speak to in a manner of, uh, you know, uh, when, we, when you were speaking, uh, influence from without in the military, a foreign influence on the military. There was a lot of talk about 
how much foreign power has had on the military. In fact, the generally received wisdom is that coup d'etats were the general, um, uh, uh, if you will, uh, uh, consequence of uh, officers who have trained in Stamf, um, Sandhurst or have gone to some war college in the US being reached by their former instructors and told to act in a particular manner in advancing the interest of that foreign power. In fact, one of my favorite uh, stories as a young man, uh, I was out in a nightclub in London many years ago and Ethiopia and Somalia had uh, just traded uh, uh, um, up allies or whatever you might. Somalia used to be a client state, uh, uh, or Ethiopia used to be a client state uh, of um, uh, Honecker's East Germany. Somalia was uh, the Americans. And we woke up one, one day, and uh, or was it the other way around? They had traded the uh, 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 patrons. And uh, while we were, you know, partying in this nightclub, so Somali and Ethiopian girls began to fight. And it was uh, uh, quite uh, uh, an incident. Um, foreign war colleges that uh, soldiers attended uh, affected the conduct of the military, especially as it involves politics in your experience. Um, well, <laughs> thanks very much uh, again for inviting me in. Uh, please, I will just chip in, take what, before I answer your question, to just chip in on one or two things. Uh, the utilization of military, the giving of uh, order, do you go to say you want to uh, stay in political office or professional office? Um, I think we shouldn't also get it wrong. If it, 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 what do you do when you are in that office is what matters. When you go and remember that you are performing a professional role for your bosses with giving the aims and objectives, you operate within that, everybody will know that you are acting professionally. And if you have to pay the price, so it is, so it may, it may be, but you will find out also that even when you go out in the larger society, people know what role you play, they will be there to support you. So I don't think it's a, do, uh, it's a thing that you go to say no. But I'm also uh, uh, happy, uh, the Admiral talk about legitimate and legal orders. Unfortunately, some of us uh, act in a way that we think we are protecting a regime and not protecting a government. There is a clear difference between a regime and the government. It's something we can discuss later, but I just wanted to put this uh, forth. And I also wanted to say that the capability the military has, I have not sure many Nigerians know. How was Ikeja Katome cleared of the bomb that took place in Ikeja? I just want to share this a little, uh, one minute of yours. When I took over from General Gumudia as chief of army staff, that case was there. I found out that the list company has quoted 390 million naira to clear Ikeja cantonment. We in the army make bold to the president and say, give us 10% of that money and we will clear our Ikeja cantonment. And that was what happened. We in the military did it using our army engineers and ordnance officers who are trained in this area to do these things. So we have capabilities, even if we don't use them outside, we will use them for the interest of the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the country. When the river Gongola overthrew it, uh, over flow it banked and divided Taraba state into two, it was the military flotation break that we deployed to act before the building of the bridge and the rehabilitation of the bridges there. It was the military that kept the, the state going. So yes, we have capabilities. We can use them for the interest of the country, 
especially if we are not using them for fighting war. And as my uh, Oga General Gumudi has said, we have these capabilities and we are there for aid of civil authority. So we continue to be instrument that government can use legally, not illegally, for government and not for regime. That is what I want to say. Then coming back to the um, act of in, uh, foreign interest, this is a fact, but also it is our fault. It is our fault because we have not inculcated patriotism, nationalism, and love for our country in our hearts. How easily can you get an American to say he was going to do anything contrary to the interests of America? How many French officers would you get them to do deliberately take decisions that would be for interest of a foreign power and not interest of their country? So what we are, uh, the challenge we have is leadership. And leadership, if not properly ex ex uh, practiced and executed, as uh, other speakers have said, people will look for another option. And when you do not have confidence, you do not have trust, when there is no credibility in your leadership, and when there is no trust between the subordinates and their leaders, then you have a real challenge. And that is why others could use you for their own national interest against your own national interest. And some of us, just because we want to get a visa or you want to get uh, uh, one or two favors, we are ready to sell our birthright for that. So it is the way we run our institutions, if the way we run our nation, the way we do our carry on with our things that would determine what other people think of us and would determine who would ever come close to us to, uh, to, for the interest of his country. I remember when I was a defense attache, I was trying to sell Nigeria's top college and war college. I won't call the name of the country. I went to one of the countries and the chief of defense forces Say, Colonel, that time I was a uh, Colonel. He said, Colonel, I want you to know we will not come to Nigeria because you will teach our officers how to stage coup. And I told him, I said, ah, but I learned one of your officers is in Kambali. And those who staged the first coup in Nigeria were in Kambali. I hope they are not teaching him how to stage coup there too. So you see, these are the things we have to be firm of what we want as a nation. It is only when there is a vacuum, when there is weak leadership, when there is no communication between the followership and the rulership, when there is no trust between colleagues, when there is no binding thing that build you together, as General Gumudi, I keep saying, national interest, national interest. When you discover that the national interest is, is reflected in sectional interest, when you discover that national interest means different thing to different people, then that is where you have the challenge. Without that, we have everything in this country to make us great. We have everything in this country to take us to the next level of development in the world. Honestly, I am so confident, having headed a company, having headed a committee that got DICON to start producing. And all the machines that were there were repaired by prefabricated spare parts made by Nigerians, by Nigerian te technologists and um, scientists. I am so confident that if there is the right leadership, the right challenge, and the right uh, um, tasking, and provision of uh, directive and motivation, honestly, the sky will be our limit. It is not a, a mistake that the largest concentration of black people are in this country. So I think, um, yes, others will act, will want to use you if you are ready to be used. But if you are not ready, they cannot put a gun in your head. Some of us, Gerald Bumudi and others that are on this platform have been trained outside Nigeria. 
They raised, he, he and some of us were lucky to rise to the highest. We have never been tool to other people to use because we are proud to be Nigerians. We are proud of this country. I am, I am so confident that uh, the way we were able to clear Ikeja Cantonment with everything, losing nothing, uh, and saving our country and uh, uh, a lot of money, is also a way that we can, with right leadership, with right direction, be where we want to be. The, the thing is that if we remove fear, if we remove this uh, feeling of exclusion, if we, if we go back to that expert de corps, whereby we have all in common, know that if one of us is losing, all of us are losing. If one of us is safe, all of us are safe. Unfortunately, insecurity has become the order of the day in our country that there's just virtually little or no development. So, um, I, I, I will pause here so that I allow other people to express their views, but I feel that the example you have given shows exactly how people act in their national interest. One time the, the Russians or USSR were in uh, Somalia and the Americans were in Ethiopia. Then the next day they switch as if they are playing things. Yes. And on a lighter note, it seems Nigerian politicians copy from that place. They switch from one party to another. <laughs> they go from Thank one you. party to the other. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so very much, General. I'm going to get into some very hard territory uh, going down from here. I, I write quite a bit on the subject of what I like to refer to as state capture. Um, South Africa is a country that I go to very frequently. And, uh, you know, a lot of the talk and the anxiety is about what they refer to as state capture. They feel that South African politicians, especially under Zuma, allowed themselves to be used uh, uh, to capture the state, as it were, where private interests overrode national interests, uh, private commercial uh, money-making interests. And they are very bitter about it. They even have a commission now on state capture. I often refer to Nigeria. I, I tell my South African friends that they don't even know what the meaning of state capture is. If they want to see state capture, they should come to Nigeria. And in my writings, I often refer to what I call the class of 66. The officers that dominated the Nigerian, uh, dominated Nigerian affairs, especially from the time of the coup to the civil war, immediate post-civil war era has been where the beginnings of the foundations of state capture were soon in Nigeria, generally referred to them as the class of 66. They may not have been in 1966, but I generally capture that group as the class of 66. Now, part of what state capture has done, it seems to me, is shown deep roots of obsession for personal wealth in the class of people near power in Nigeria, including soldiers. And this has, in my view, many times detracted significantly from the advance of our general interest as a country and has sown the seeds of nepotism, corruption, and in many, many ways, um, the, the, the death of meritocracy, even in the military as an institution. Um, I would like to return to General Umahi to, um, as someone whose background is political science, reflect some on this. And then I'll come back to uh, uh, General Gumudia really on this matter. After that, I would like to go to uh, uh, the role of the military in emergency operations locally, you know, and, and finally, I'd like to begin to close on how do we purge the army of these, these problems that we, we have seen fester over the years? What does the army do to redeem itself, to become that professional, highly regarded army, which I've had the privilege of listening to uh, people talk about abroad, especially in the role the military has played in peacekeeping operations around the world, which shaped our foreign policy 
and, and, and all of that. So, uh, General Mai. Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Piyu, thank you once again. Um, I, I want to say, maybe differ a little from um, uh, an, uh, a point of view earlier conversed. It's true that uh, in some other countries, external influences may have played a dominant role um, resulting in coups and counter coups. But I think in the case of Nigeria, Nigeria ab initio has been a little bit sophisticated to submit to all those obvious external influences. It's not that we are not influenced in one way or the other, but I am talking about organizing coup. Uh, I, I'll talk about this a, a little bit before I go to state capture. Now, if you study each of the coups in Nigeria, you'll find out that they fall into some categories and they overlap, the categories overlap. Number one, some of them were as a result of ethnic rivalries. Or they are people who want their ethnic group to keep grip and hold, stronghold on the political power of the nation. Those people are those who actually fall into the categories of people who have captured the state. And going from there, you will talk about intra-military quarrels, not necessarily external influences, intra-military quarrels. Some people, there could be personality clash resulting in those who are not, who are opposed to the military in power to organize a coup of their own in order to topple those who they do not agree with. Closely related to that is personal jealousies. Then ambitions. Like someone told me one day, a military officer, he said, while we were still in service, he said, I will never retire from this army except I hold a political office, except I become a governor, except I become a minister, except I rise to the top. Hmm. That day I was a little bit afraid and I began to look at that officer from a particular perspective. And then another reason beside external influences is personal fear. When the regime in power is afraid that there are some people not in government with them that are likely to topple their government, they will come up with the phantom coup, they will come up with what they will call, uh, what they call coup, but it's actually phantom coup. It's not a coup. Uh, you study coup in Nigeria, you find out those that fall into that category. Now, away from that and a little bit to that of the state capture, even today in the military, there are still influences from outside that decide what happens in the military today. You know, the problem with Nigeria generally, and that is why things are not working the way they should. And Obama pointed it out when he said that in Africa, we have strong personalities and weak institutions. But it should be the other way around. Any nation that will make progress, any military that will make progress will have weak personalities and strong institutions. 
And that for any nation to have strong institutions, there must be a development and continuous growth of political culture. Where institutions that have to do with politics, that have to do with instrument of power, appear very strong that no one man can override it. In the military, it has always been there and it is still there today. And that is why things are not changing as fast as people expect. You see, to be the chief of army staff is a wonderful thing. You have a lot of power. But where the chief of army staff exists as the unquestionable authority, as an authority that believes that he knows it all and that no other person junior to him has a brighter idea on particular issues. And it is a common thing in the military. In the military, Nigerian military, they often aggregate wisdom with seniority. They believe that you, when you are a senior, that you obviously command superior ideas. But I think all of that, developed world in other climes is not so. And on, that is also state capture. When you have captured the process of decision making and arrogate wisdom and power to yourself alone, that organization can never move forward. And I think it is a problem in the Nigerian military and in the Nigerian nation for us to correct these things, we must begin to de-emphasize personality. We must begin to disabuse this issue of people who are outside calling the shots. For instance, you find out that the, the, the politicians dictate who should be promoted in the military and who should not be promoted. When promotion time is coming, you will see the chief of army staff getting all sorts of names for promotion. And if the chief of army staff is not resolute, you find out that more than 80% of those who will be promoted will be those who are not as qualified as those that will not be promoted thereby celebrating mediocrity. And an institution that celebrates mediocrity can never come first class in anything. I think these are the issues. Who are those involved in state capture or in the capture of the military that makes it difficult for the military to develop the way it's supposed to develop? those who are in political offices and those who are making it possible for Nigeria to move forward today are those who have also captured the state. Those who stay in their offices and determine the direction that the head of state should go, a governor should go, the senior president should go. I think until these issues are properly brought to the fore and dealt with drastically, it will be difficult for the nation Nigeria to grow. It will be difficult for the Nigerian military to grow in the trajectory that it's supposed to be. For instance, when I, I, I just want to make a quotation that brings shame on me when they talk about the military in power. Now, I know there are some, so many things that the military did well, but a military like uh, the e Egyptian military, where they, were, they did martial law and they came out with great development. Nigeria lost opportunity 
of going to the greater height with the military in power, because that's where you can do stuff without bottlenecks to help a country grow. You know, here is a gem of description from the pen of mighty Dr. Taishu Larin of the blessed memory. He was describing the a fugitive regime of one of the military governments. And he said, and I quote, he said it was a regime of naked barbarism, shameless profligacy, and unbridled licentiousness. And I'm sure that regime did not come out to perform abysmally in such a way that it could attract this kind of description. There were people outside playing from the sidelines who captured state power. But that man was just a guinea pig that they used to brought such terrible description of a military regime. Let me just stop there for now. Well, thank, well, thank you. you so very much. Uh, in going forward, as um, I, I asked back General Gumudia, in, in, in the history of statecraft, one of the uh, fascinating ones to me of purge of a country and a military of uh, more primordial inclinations and all of that, and it became a force for development, is that of Kemal Atatürk in Turkey. Uh, that created a more secular Turkey. Um, if we had to reform Nigeria's military and purge it of the apparently now extreme levels of ethnicity, um, of um, you know people relying more on uh, political networking to move up rather than pure merit, um, how would an Atatok play? in the reforming of the Nigerian army or armed forces as we know them today? I, I, I think, oh, am I, am I, am I yeah, the author? I can hear you. Yes. I, oh, I no, no, think... no, no, General Gumudia. OK, unless you want to make a quick okay. comment. OK, okay no, you, let him go on. It's my yeah. organ. Yes, hmm. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. okay. Uh, first, <laughs> let me thank uh, General Umahi for to say that well, I heard you loud and clear. <laughs> uh, it is not true that once people become chief of army staff, they then have they arrogate to themselves all the knowledge in the world. If they do, some of us will not have done certain things we did. For instance, I had a think tank when I was in office. And I looked at the brightest. I got some officers to put these names together. And so I said, look, I want a paper on Nigerian Army yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And what came out is quite revealing. That is from there I started talking about uh, uh, attitudinal change and things like that. But you see, even those who came after me, they also listened to some subordinates. I think uh, it's not as bad as you say. The, you must know that the office of the chief is unique. Hard, very hard decisions are going to be taken there. Decisions of life and death, they are going to be taken. So. It is not a place where you are going to go there with feeble mind. Now, if you are determined to solve a problem and you listen to all sorts of things and you have taken a position, the fact that you took a position that is contrary to somebody else does not mean that you don't listen to, to superior reasoning. No, that is uh, uh, about that sort of thing. Now, I um, the issue, let me also reflect on something which uh, Aguay touched also, which is, uh, I think I am on the same page with him. 
uh, he, you know, when you talk of foreign influence on the conduct of our officers that uh, led to change of government and things like that, I would like to first of all say that that kind of perception is in the realm of speculation. It's not something you can hold in your hand. Because how, for instance, like he rightly said, both of us were trained outside. I, I, I trained in the US, I trained in India. And so how, wh what is in this country today that we skewed in favor of India or in America? Anybody who wants to, who is going to be influenced in the interests of another country, probably will want that government to be skewed in favor of their their own interest either more contractors coming from there or some trade which you can do anyway without necessarily doing a coup so uh, sometimes people think that is what happened but like i said you must be somebody who is usable that's why they will use you otherwise i go there for the sake of my country to learn and train and and be able to, to, to defend my country. And then there immediately you get me to your side and say, okay, no, I should work against my country. You know, that's gonna fail. If I was that kind of officer, God knows I could never have got to the top of, of the system. And anybody who does that, just watch, you will fall by the wayside. You won't get anywhere. So all those who were responsible for anything they did within our system is certainly personal. They, uh, they may have felt by doing one thing or taking over at a particular point, it was solving a political problem. Whether it finally solved the problem or not is for Nigerians to judge. Uh, today now, uh, people now know that uh, the cancellation of the, the, that June 12 problem, the election that was canceled, it's a big problem. We didn't really need to, uh, but uh, again, every leader has his own pressure. So I, it's difficult for me to sit down here and judge whoever took whatever decision and all that. But uh, I always believe we must act in this general interest of what uh, some what act in an altruistic manner so as to, to solve problems of our nation. We need to move our nation also into the next, uh, next level. We can't remain the a developing country since I was a cadet, they kept referring to us as a potential uh, uh, power. We are, we, we are a country that uh, they should watch and all that. We, we are a developing country till today. 60 years after, we are still a developing country. That to me is not uh, uh, speaking well of how we have managed uh, things. Now, I believe also that uh, uh, the way we have approached certain things in the military, uh, the Egyptian example, which everybody seemed to have locked on, it is possible if we have the policies clear. But I'm saying that it will be a, some specific units that will be involved in that. We cannot, I can't bring my men from the armor and say, oh yeah, go and be doing farming or bring my infantry people go and be doing farming when they should be training. We, we don't train enough as a matter of fact, if anything at all, we don't train enough. So that if we train enough, there'll be no time for soldiers to, to be found anywhere easily. Either in one exercise or the other, range classification, they're trekking, they are doing one thing or the other. They go on camping for, for, for weeks, and uh, all that takes out a lot of uh, commitment. So if we do the bid that is needed for the military to, to, to excel, I think it will, be, it, it will do well. Now, let me also say that throughout my service, my years at the top, I don't know of anybody who put pressure on me to promote anybody. I'm telling you quite frankly. If you doubt, go and find out. The, 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 my commander, s and T. 
I kept quiet. I didn't intervene in the promotion <laughs> promotion board, and he didn't make it. But I have known him. He's quite a brilliant officer. So I laughed and I said, "Okay, let me see. Is there any other person senior to him in the court?" Luckily, there was no. So I said, "Okay, leave, leave him there. He should remain there." And in the next promotion board, he made it. The president I served never one day called me and said, look, Alex, I want this, this, this promoted. So once I had that kind of authority from my boss that this thing, or even the minister will never call you. During my time, I don't know what became of the system. I left 14 years ago. So perhaps uh, anybody, the thing may have changed. I don't know. <laughs> but in my time, I'm telling you, no minister ever called me. I served with Danjuma, then I Danjuma, I served with uh, I served with this uh, 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 for Malam uh, Batagarawa. They were all there. You see, so it's not true that all the time these promotions are determined from outside. Now it may begin to point that direction. I don't know. I don't know. I, it is what you see. It's not good to to make a a categorical statement when you don't have the facts. I don't have the facts to say that promotions are essentially based on pressures from outside only. No. Don't forget that the promotion also has its own regulations. The process has its own regulations. You can't promote more than 60% of available vacancies in any promotion year. That is how it is done. So what pressures will, bring, will people bring that will make a chief just wake up and begin to promote incompetent people and all that. No, it's uh, it's very difficult. Uh, it may be the situation now, like I said. I but I tell you quite frankly, I can I don't know. I'm not uh, current on that. But I think that by and large, uh, a lot can be achieved with the with with the uh, joint effort of the military and the civil. We've said it even, there's no point going over it again in terms of some of the engineering resources that can be brought together to do a job. Even research and development, the kind of manpower that can do research, they are not essentially in the military. You have PhD professors and all that who can weigh into the defense industrial complex. So those kind of people, if they don't believe in the security of our country, they don't believe in the progress of our country, they will not, of course, participate in it. Be it even in the area of political science. Those who, the eggheads in political science, if they don't believe in something, if you call them for a seminar, they won't come. But that, that, that they believe in the security. We don't have any other country anyway, apart from this one. So all these people put together, Working in question with the armed, for, the armed forces is what will, will make the day. That's, uh, that, that's the bit I'd like to contribute. So, thanks. Hello? Hello? I'm sorry, I think I, I didn't unmute myself. Uh, um, I was saying that uh, there is a um, a gentleman who's written a series of books, Max Solium, um, the series uh, um, Soldiers of Fortune, in describing the military and power in Nigeria and the personalities and how so they that... age, uh, to uh, determine the course of Nigerian history. Now, in looking back at all <clears throat> the games that we have played, one of the things that fascinates me as a person is that military rule makes it easier to make some very complex kinds of decisions. For example, yes. in all of civilian history in Nigeria, um, state creation under civilians happened only once, the creation of the Midwest. But the military kept creating states, creating local governments with ease. Uh, <laughs> as it may seem to have turned out, but because hindsight is always 2020, maybe it was, uh, it could have been differently seen then. Uh, many of those decisions have probably done more harm than good. 
Um, could we have used better the ease of decision making within a military structure compared to a political structure uh, in the way that we try to solve national problems? Uh, I'm, 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 to know, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, um, benefit of hindsight, uh, things like creation of states, creation of local governments. I, I, I give an example, uh, and this is why I say it's a matter of uh, uh, um, kind of knowledge that people apply. One of the uh, real big challenges for growth and development in Nigeria is the structure of local governments. Uh, before 1975, 76, local governments were not part of the federating units in our country, but only national government and subnational government. Uh, by 76, changes have been made after the Dasuki Commission, General Basanjo made choices, and the third tier of government was now part of fiscal transfers. Um, of course, the number of local governments in some parts of the country ratcheted up very quickly. Uh, because they were soldiers who were dominant in policy making, who came from those parts of the country. And <coughs> we went from a situation where there were a lot more local governments in the South before 66 to twice as many in the North versus the South thereafter. Whether this was rational or logical is not the question um, here. But benefit of hindsight now shows that that has not brought more development to the areas that have now received more money from the Federation account. Instead, the reality is that they have become poorer. Um, in your judgment, was this ease of making decision uh, not a debilitating factor rather than a facilitating factor? Because many of those decisions seem to have done more harm than good in the end. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Well, one of the first things that I would like us to remember is that even though the military was in power and we had the administrators or the governors, as the case may be, uh, we really mustn't forget that directly below them in hierarchy, were the civil servants. And all the military did, like you rightly said, was to fast track whatever decisions or whatever papers or whatever policies were presented to them by the civil servants. You will note that even though in those days, um, there was a proliferation of um, local governments and probably even um, states. You will note that there was always agitation for those local governments or states by the people themselves. So the scenario was usually that say uh, military governor A who happens to come from area B would host a delegation of his townspeople, his king's men, who would uh, come cap in hand, ask for a nice local government to be carved out for them. Now the enabling legislation was not drafted by the military. It was drafted by the civil servants. What the military did was to make sure that that process was fast tracked. And the only reason why the process was easy to fast track was because it was a unitary hierarchy. Uh, you didn't have to go to the upper house, the lower house, debate, uh, first, second, third, and fourth readings, and all those kind of things. So for me, I really don't think that it was a case of um, many local governments, proliferation of local governments coming because the 
people, the, the military people who were in power at the time necessarily, I mean, I'm not saying that that didn't happen in some cases, but if we think back, like you said, uh, you will see so many newspaper adverts, you know, people agitating for lower XYZ um, um, local government, East uh, something local government, West something local government to be carved out of. All those were yearnings and aspirations of the people. And I would like to say that the people took advantage of the fact that the military could make things happen very quickly and they made it happen very quickly. I also know that um, my boss, General Agwai, had mentioned that, you know, um, in those days, um, he was an order and he was professional. You went ahead and did it. The important thing is that the right papers are put before you. And all the courses that we went on, and like he said, um, it's amazing how extraordinarily well-trained those of us who are in the military were. So you were taught to read, you were taught to look at the papers that were put before you. And if those papers made sense, you went ahead and did what you needed to do very quickly. And it wasn't just the military, uh, it wasn't just the, um, creation of local governments and um, states that was quick. Like he said, a lot of repair work was done very quickly. A lot of um, legislation, even I make bold to say the, the, the constitution that we're talking about now, uh, it was done very quickly. So for me, um, having learned the lessons of history, knowing the past. For me, it's how do we um, apply this moving forward? Because the truth of the matter is, uh, even though I'm not a political scientist like um, General Omehi, but one thing that I do know for sure is that every country needs to evolve what will work for it. So if we look back at history, and we look at how very quickly a lot of things were done. Isn't there perhaps a way we could integrate that into our political system now, such that we have a unique system that works for us culturally and yet allows us to do things? I mean, dare we think out of the box? Dare we go a different way? Is there anything that says that our political system has to mirror what is happening in the UK or the US? Is there really anything that says that? Can't we look back at this ease or at this speed of making decisions, of making things happen? Can't we look at that and see how we can incorporate that into our, uh, into our political system as it is today, such that we evolve a system that is just ours. Uh, so for me, I would like us to think about that slightly unorthodox um, way of looking at things and uh, see how the fact that we had the military with us how it can impact what we're doing now moving forward positively. Uh, that's Thank my- you Thank you very much. I'm gonna to go to the closing uh, question, which I would like to invite. Um, uh, uh, by the way, we, as we, you know, this is targeted at young people for their learning and we have co-hosts who are young people uh, I would like to take a question or two, a question from each one of one or two of them, and then uh, my closing question, just for reflection, is military operation effectiveness. Uh, there's a lot of talk about less, not being as effective as we could be in challenges in the northeast and elsewhere, and um, I want you to reflect on that. Where Claire, 
uh, asks a question from uh, the US, one of my co-hosts. Uh, Claire, yes, go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for being with us. I think having taken a look backwards, I think I'd like to bring things to a more modern day scenario. With everything going on with SARS in Nigeria and with what has become more commonplace in that at street level in Nigeria, we see it very common. There are lots of videos uploaded every day that Nigerian military, individual, mil individuals, military personnel have seen to abuse their power. And in paralleling this to, of course, we should not aspire to the US and UK, but paralleling this to military members in the US and in the UK, it is not often, if ever, seen that individuals in the military are abusing their power and bullying the people in their nation on the streets. Never do you see military action taken against individuals without the express control and command of the ruling powers, as we've seen recently with Black Lives Matter in the USA. So bringing it down to values, what are the values currently in the military institution that have enabled it such that we see abuse of power consistently and often in the streets, more from police, but also as well from military individuals on the streets of Nigeria? Thank you very much. Uh, excellent uh, question from Claire there. Uh, I am just about to put out a statement on the latest killing by SARS. Uh, it is not acceptable that we should have the kind of situation we have in our country where people who are in positions of public authority abuse civilians about this. And I just like any quick reactions from any or all of our, uh, our military leaders on this panel. Uh, this is police, yes, with SARS, but the same thing we see military personnel beating up civilians on the streets in ways that are just absolutely indecent, unacceptable. Uh, if Black lives matter in America, Nigerian youth lives matter. Why does the culture in the military degenerate so badly that these things can be seen happening every day? Sorry, I, I General Aguay, please, maybe we'll start with you. Can you comment, quick comment on that? Uh, I thought you were going to add the political scientist. Oh, okay. That, but <laughs> Whoever, I said everybody can give it, take one minute on that. Okay, w what <laughs> I would want to say, honestly, sometimes we become so, I, 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 I'm worried because uh, so, uh, the military must live above board. But sometimes we become over, we become over critical of the military forgetting that the military mirrors our society. If you look at the bigger picture, most of our uh, problem, we want to solve them through violence. Uh, so it tells two things. Either we have a culture of the only way we can make ourselves seen and heard and make people obey is through violence, or we have this uh, ignorance by everybody accepting that violence is right. Uh, it's wrong, absolutely unacceptable, but also it also mirrors our society that we do a lot of unimaginable things to ourselves uh, and you can see it's translated in the, the letter trade uh, where people make quick money kidnapping. Somebody is kidnapped and after he's kidnapped, uh, you go to pay, people go to pay ransom, they are also kidnapped after. So these are some of the challenges that we have. But I want to say that the military has to train itself and not only the military, but even the, uh, the, the other paramilitary organizations, we have to train ourselves the more and more and more so that people become very professional in handling their equipment so that even if it is accidental discharge, it will never happen because we're dealing with professionals. Thank you very much. 
Ajara Mahi, were you going to make a quick comment on that? Uh, yes, Prof. I, I want to say that uh, this points directly to the issue of civil military relations. And uh, that's an area I think um, the next time you are calling people together uh, to talk about um, how the military should do its real job in order to enhance um, the growth of the state. So I, I think it has to do with civil military relations. The long stay of the military in power has actually militarized the state. Nigeria is more or less like a police state. The civilian is no longer considered as a taxpayer that pays the salaries of the men in the security sector. The security sector see themselves as the boss of the civilians. Civil military relations redirects the thoughts and the minds of members of the security forces that civilians are the boss. And that we are supposed to subject, the military is supposed to subject itself to the directives, to the control of the political power. So, but even today, you see politicians are acting as soldiers. <laughs> they arrest without trial. They tell police detain without trial. They deal with opponents as if they are dealing with petty criminals. So I think this transcends across the length of the Nigerian state, the length and breadth of the Nigerian state. So the only way to deal with it when it comes to the military is security reform. Our security needs to be reformed. This soldier has to learn what is supposed to be his relationship with the civil authority. The, the soldier has to learn that the civil authority is the boss. And we are serving, the soldiers are serving as tools in the hands of the political masters to achieve state needs. So the moment we deal with civil relations very deeply in such a way that everybody understands his position in terms of the constitution, then of course, we'll be doing the right thing. Soldier may not be behaving that way on the street any longer. And I want to also add that a soldier should understand that his loyalty is to the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And as long as soldiers and security agencies are not used as tool to achieve political ends of a party, then the soldier, the military, the security agencies cannot abuse civilians. But if they are working hands in gloves with the people in political power, to, to abuse maybe opponents, to abuse those who do not share the same ideas with them, then if, of course, it means that we will continue to entrench this particular culture rather than dealing with it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll quickly sum up because we are now over, over our time. There are a number of people who are waiting, raising their hands. Just in one fell swoop, in no more than 30 seconds each, please. Can we take uh, Leo Fadaka, Austin Amuzie, Ayodelia Falabi, and Bola Adetula? Please, one 30 seconds for each question. All of them will be taken. They will ask any to reply. Leo Fadaka. Unmute yourself, please. Unmute yourself. We're not hearing. All right. Yes, please go ahead. 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, I said the military has taken the country into uh, a certain level. First is the creation of uh, states and local government, which threw up ethnocentric nationalities and bigotry. The educational system was degraded with quota system and different cut off uh, marks for admissions into secondary and uh, tertiary institution. Recruitment into the civil service. Please remember, it's only 30 seconds we have. Yes, recruitment into the civil service was uh, worrisome. Now, I ask, what is the way forward in all these contraptions, which are the banes of uh, Nigeria development? All right, well, thank you very much. If we can go to Austin Amuzie. Mr. Amuzie. I'm Steve Morton. Okay. I'm mute. I, I greet every one of us. Sir. I we just like to um, speak on um, a thing. I want to is that the um, Kiriku Mazmon prison for inmates, correctional center, sorry. Uh, one of the days I overheard one of the military personnel there complaining about um, the state of the prisoners and the challenges there. And he was like, what if government will come probably set up things that these prisoners will be doing, at least to end revenue for the country. And although this is something that I've actually had in mind and it's part of the program I'm doing also is empowering them to be able to set up some few things. And currently working on a project to set up something there. But why can't we have the military like setting up things? Now, the military shouldn't be the one to do some of this job, but they can set this thing also that these prisoners will engage in those programs in probably farming, in those industrial, um, Mm. Thank you. Yeah, All right, uh, can we take uh, uh, Mr. Falabi? Mr. Falabi? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, it's just a very quick one. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Okay. It's just a very quick one to I remember during this program, uh, General Obi was uh, trying to say how the, the outside factor influence uh, promotion in the uh, in the military, in the police, and other parastata. From time immemorial, it has always been like that. Uh, it is good for any senior officers to come out and say it has not always been like that. It would be a good thing if the junior ones who has been there have always been of that level and we know how it happened. We have walked in the corridor of power. We move around, we see what happened. There has always been factor that influence. Let's not forget about quota system. Quota system is one of the things that influence uh, this factor that make people politicians to say, these are the people. We have 20 people in Borno and we, we are going to be choosing five of them. So it influences it, and we cannot do away from it until we revisit our constitution that was created for us, designed for us by the military. In as much as we still have that constitution and the coastal system is still there, people will still be marginalized. I was one time in, in there, and when promotion came, my name was omitted until when I have to cry to the most senior person who later said, go and investigate before they now discover that somebody else who was five years my junior, was, his name was used to replace my name. So that thing is still there. A lot of people are suffering from that. It's okay, thank, thing. thank you it so much. People, I appreciate that, but time it is It made up. people to be hungry. Not our best friend. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Right. So we hope that's happen in future. Yes, uh, I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Guam, Dr. Uche Guam, who seems to be in a hospital bed. Uh, so please um, ask a quick question. Unmute, please unmute yourself. You need to unmute. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. But, in, you know, yeah. you see, uh, I, I want to be very fast. In, uh, in, in political science today, modern political science, there's a course called 
futurism. It's a part of political behavior. He's been. Yeah, you're, you're muted again. Can you unmute quickly? You know, uh -huh. am, am I? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, now? yeah, we can hear you now. You know, I'm, I'm saying that in political behavior, there's a course called futurism. Yeah. Being driven by Harvard University, by particularly by Professor Rappaport, where you create a series of generalizations and geopolitical theories and use those theories to predict issues, to predict events. So, uh, General Agumohi, Umayi, and all the powerful military men who were participants in military rulership in Nigeria. You know, I want them, I want uh, at least one of them to answer this question. If the military had not entered Nigerian body politics in 1966, both January 1966 and June 1966, where do you think Nigeria would have been in terms of development? I'm talking about political development, economic development, and social development. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Ditula, please, 30 seconds. Uh, thank you very much. I've been raising my hand for the past one and a half hours. Quick yes, note. but the, the tradition is that we allow questions only towards the end. Okay, 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 okay. No problem. Yes. Now, there had been some fantastic, hardworking military men and women in the past who are retired. Is it a taboo for the current military guys to make use of those talents in the current insecurity situation we find ourselves right now. Um, while I was in the African Union Commission, Colonel Wako really did well at the African Union Peace Mission that when his term ended, the uh, heads of state made a special request to Nigeria and the AU that he should, his term should be extended because they saw what he was doing. Now, what, what is happening to him in retirement? Dr. Ovaji, because some, somebody mentioned that uh, they also made some invention. I remember in those days, one Dr. Ovaji, Ovaji made some invention on blood or whatever it is. Where is he right now? The last one, um, Rear Admiral Utunut spoke about the military hospital. Our military hospitals in Nigeria is in shambles. I stopped going there the day they asked me to bring my exercise book to bring an exercise book to use as case notes. They don't even have case notes for us. So how would they have drugs? Thank you very okay. much. Thank you so very much. Uh, anyone who would like to just answer just one, one minute, anybody who would like to, doesn't have to be any particular person Thank from you. our panel. Uh, can I? Eric, the, yes, can I? General. Yeah, Which of the general? General Gumudia. OK. I said I heard his yeah. voice. Yeah. Um, the first, this, uh, I've heard so much about the military or soldiers misbehaving outside and all that extra uh, uh, constitutional or judicial powers or whatever. Now, to me, it will sound too, too generalizing because you see, there is no institution in this country today that has the 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 the, uh, the structure to discipline their members any better than the military. If if uh, the, the summary trial cannot handle matters, you go for a court martial, and that will send you to the same jail or even death penalty, oh, subject to approval by Mr. President. So so that is already there. Now we also must understand when a soldier is acting as an individual and that becomes an individual character rather than an institutional character. Yes, people have felt because of our uh, 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 aggressive way of training and all that, so people are doing certain things that uh, seem to show that this is uh, institutional. It is not necessarily so. Look at America. They've been in Japan since the Second World War. And the American the one GI raped a woman, in, raped a girl, not even a woman, in, uh, in, in Japan. Of course, they have to deal with him. That, uh, that incident didn't define the American military man. So if there, is, if there are issues and if they are brought to the knowledge of the authority, of course, action will go against those people. I tell you quite frankly. But you, something happens, 
the authority does not even know that because you, you are not going to live with them in the streets out there. And and then in the end, uh, it's like, oh, the military is, uh, is so bad. And all. I hate to defend anything bad. I hate it. But we need to, even Nigeria today is what we are suffering. Nigerians have made waves in America. Those, th those things that we've done are not defining Nigeria. It is the one who did uh, Yahoo. That is what is defining Nigeria. So our country must stand up and defend Nigeria itself, that, defend Nigerians. And that's what I'm trying to say, that it is not, it's not an institutional character to misbehave anywhere. There is discipline, there's discipline. So uh, I want to say that. And the other thing I would like to uh, comment on is the last one where someone said, what would have been the fate of Nigeria if the military did not enter politics in 1966? The answer is, is as good as mine. But if I were to, to give some further analysis, I would predict that we'll probably have been better off in the sense that uh, the federation, the federalism we had, at that time, saw us as a promising nation. All the countries we started with, they've gone, they've left us behind. In the next 20 years, we can't catch uh, Brazil. Look, our defense industry was set up in 1964. The one in India was set up in 1962. Now, in two years, can we begin to make uh, tanks and fighter aircrafts and all that, or submarines? No. So. They have they have gone because they remain democratic, and that is and in a democracy, thorough arguments are made to to drive home a policy. Look at the British; they've been on Brexit for three almost three years, arguing it. So all the bad corners of that problem, the fault lines, everything will will be brought out. So when the final decision is taken, it will be in the interest of national interest or national. Uh, 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 national uh, 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 development. And so I, I am of the view that if we had continued that time with the competition that was there among the regions, look at Ibadan. From Coco, Aulawa built uh, the Coco House and uh, brought television, brought uh, uh, all sorts of things. And the North was pulling its own way too. The East was, of course, pulling its way. So I can say that if the military had intervened, I think that by now we will have joined the advanced countries. But uh, that, is, that is assuming that all the leaders didn't see how their own ethnic group would be superior to others. If, mm -hmm. if uh, at any point any of those three regions felt to, wanted to be superior, of course we will have gone back to the kind of problems that, that, that can easily affect the nation. So uh, on the broad general line, I like to say that it, Nigeria would have been better off without the, the coup of 1966. It wasn't uh, it, it, because the nation was, was at least as a, a new, a young country that was just starting, uh, things were in place. But you can see how politics and rigged elections led to all sorts of crises that led to the away tier in the Western region. That away tier was virtually something that would have turn everything upside down. And so anybody can justify whatever coup or whatever he wanted to do in an attempt to try and resolve that kind of thing if the national body didn't resolve it. So I think these are some of the kind of things that are playing out. But otherwise, uh, democracy any day, is, uh, I think it has an edge over uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, thank, uh, thank you so uh, much, General. Autocratic, autocratic way of doing it. Thanks. Mm. Thank you. Any other panelists want to say anything? If not, I will. Yeah, yes, okay. yes, I can, I can, I can, can say I... one thing. Please, right. please. Okay, come on, Jeremiah. Oh, okay. Um, for like, uh, I think um, you are, you, 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 oh, okay. you, you talked about maladministration. I agree with you. Because even when the military embarked on states creation and all those restructuring, they were done not in a very good fit. Because rather than creating states of merit, creating local governments of merit, they use what is called political gerrymandering in order to disadvantage some. 
an advantage, give some people advantage over others. So I agree with you that uh, maladministration was evident in military regime, whereas it ought to have been used effectively to place Nigeria on a higher strategic position. So I think um, the way forward, uh, agreeing with um, Folake and then uh, Uche Wam, talking about tourism, he said, Nigeria to change things should embark on security sector reforms, we should embark on civil military relations, we should embark on establishing strong political institution, political culture. We should have strong growing political culture. Uh, you know, um, uh, Bill Collins, uh, 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 former British, I mean, um, United States uh, president, Bill Clinton, he said that there is nothing wrong with a nation wobbling, but it's important that such a nation must be wobbling in the right direction. Nigeria needs to begin to wobble in the right direction to correct the ills of the past. And uh, uh, Uche, I, I, this futurism, is, is, it, it can go either way. The military, like I told you, that Uzogu said at the time they, they, they took over power, he said that the only place where you can find true Nigerian was in the army. Because the people in the army then were like a family. They love this nation. There was no tribe, no tongue, no religion, but things changed as time went on. So you may not, you may say, well, based on what General Gomudia said, if army didn't intervene, the restructuring of uh, changing from a federalism to a unitary system that we are practicing even till today wouldn't have been there. Um, maybe we would have uh, been running with unitary system, but the way it's here and all those political problems could have drawn Nigeria into civil war earlier than the time it did. So okay, I want to General. say... Hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, thank you so very much. Uh, General Martin Luther, why I wanted to make a closing comment, and I think we'll close from there. Well, let, let me not keep anybody any longer. All I wanted to say was about quota system or federal character. Uh, again, I... I, I think there is nothing wrong with them. It is the implementation and those who are executing it that are playing all the havoc. For example, if you give everybody a quota at entrance, does he have to carry the quota to the end? I have even asked during my military days that if you, if we, are we going to die by quota? For example, if we go to battle and 10 people from Northeast are killed. Do we now stop the Northeasterners fighting so that we get the other quotas? I think the truth of it is that we as people must be honest and sincere. Uh, if you are given a quota and giving it to the best, there won't be any problem. But if you are using it for nepotism and other things, that is where the challenge is. So together, we can always stand up for what is right. And this country, would go back to be as great as all of us want it to be. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so, so very much. And by the way, I agree with you that affirmative action is part of the way of ensuring that we have a representative system, but it is the abuse of this that turns it into the kind of challenge that we now have. Well, I want to thank all our very special guests, uh, former Chiefs of Defense Staff, General Umai, Admiral Hotunu, and all our participants for an engaging conversation from which our young people can learn a lot and can help us begin to focus more on how we can go forward. Let me also hope that others who are currently in service can draw something from this to begin to think of how to reform so that things can be better. It has been done before. I've given the example of Atta Talk, and I think we can, because our country can be great again. Thank you all so much. Have a very pleasant rest of this weekend. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, bro. Thank you, we really appreciate you. John, you've been sneezing and coughing persistently for the past three days. Mary, I am tired. I don't know what else to take. I have taken all the cough syrups I can lay my hands on and they are not just working. Haven't you heard of Neophylline Cough Syrup? Neophylline? Yes, Neophylline Cough Syrup provides fast relief for cough, cold and catar, and it's good for babies, children, and adults. Neophylline Cough Syrup, a product of Mopsum Pharmaceutical Limited and is available in pharmacies nationwide. If symptom persists after three days, please consult your doctor. Neophylline Cough Syrup, a quality product.